Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to another episode of Island Spot Sports. And before we get to our guest today, we have a big shout out for, for Living Sisu. Living Sisu is a platform and app that wants to give you all the tools to have success in your sport. Their main objective is to activate your lifestyle. So for active, it's for active people. Enjoy discounts at, at companies like BioSteel, 30% off, Body Logics, The Goalie Guild, all his books are discounted. Roan, Lululemon for men. 20% off online stretching programs with eccentrics, one full month free. They got super silent massage guns, 20% off those. And it's a great quality. It's way less expensive than a Theragun and it's a great, it's great quality. So there's so many more discounts that you guys will need to just become a member to see. So they want to provide you with anything you need for success. So come join the community. I'm a part of it. A bunch of other athletes are a part of it, so it's free to join. It takes 20 seconds to have it, to get exclusive offers to your sport, and it's definitely worth worth it. So, do do us a huge favor and go sign up for Living Sisu's membership. It's free, 20 takes 20 seconds, so go do it, and we'll see you there. Living Sisu is a great company. We uh we know one of the co-founders, Zach Fricali. He's a great guy. He uh. He's the co-founder and he does a lot of live streams on Instagram at, uh, at Living Sisu and with a bunch of elite athletes. And you learn a lot from like the athlete's determination, the resiliency, everything to what me, made them become successful. So it's been a great experience so far. So go on. I'm going to leave uh, the link in the description. So uh, go sign up. Yo, welcome back to another episode of On The Spot Sports. I'm Jack, and in today's episode, we are joined by a very special guest, former professional hockey player and current owner of Total Performance Fitness, Tyler Palmer. Tyler is now the owner for Total Performance Fitness, and he played pro hockey for two years at the SPHL and the ECHL levels. Welcome to the show, Tyler Palmer. How are you, buddy? Doing awesome, buddy. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, no problem. It's gonna gonna be fun. So let's let's get this thing going. Get this thing on the road. Let's do it. Yeah. So can you give our viewers a little background information on like how important hockey was for you growing up? Why you started playing hockey and what you're doing now, today post hockey? Totally. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously being in Canada, I know it's the biggest cliche in the world, but it's it re- it really is. You know, j- just from an early age, especially my my dad was big into hockey. Um, he was a pretty good player my grandpa was into it so I've I've always been around it but I could I could skate almost before I could walk so that was a pretty early indication that you know it was going to be something um, that I was I was going to have fun at and and my parents never really you know they they got me a pair of skates really young and I really like skating but they never really pushed me in that direction I just you know from from the youngest time I can remember I was just I was so infatuated with it and and the the gear and, and the players and being I remember going to my first NHL game when we moved from our, our where I was born to Edmonton and we got to see the Mighty Ducks play. And I remember being like six years old and Timo Solani, we were right at you know, right down beside the glass and Timo Solani like turned around and he spit on the glass and I lost my mind. Like I thought it was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I was like, like shaking my mom. I was like, mom, I want to be a hockey player. Mom, I want to be a hockey player. But I've just, you know, it was always around me. And I, I from the moment I started playing, it's, it's been, you know, a big, big part of my life, obviously. And I, I hope that, you know, in my post career now that it can continue to be that way. Um, and so far it has, and really I can't envision myself doing anything unrelated to hockey at this point. It's been such a big part of my life. Um, so yeah, I just grew up around Edmonton playing hockey and I played all the way up. I played junior back in my hometown, um, went on and played three and a half years university here in Edmonton, um, took a year off from injury. Um, and then I was lucky enough to sign a pro contract with Kansas city actually, um, in the ECHL. I didn't stick there, but that's when I went down to the SP, um, played a bit there that year. Then I got called back up to Greenville, um, had a quick stint there and then ended up getting traded to Fayetteville at the trade deadline played out the rest of that year and then played one more year um, and then decided to call it and luckily kind of fell into um, this kind of post career. Um, the guy who trained me for my whole playing career, basically since I was probably 15, 16, Brett Kirkland, who owns our gym here, 
um, he, uh, you know, kind of reached out and said, like, do you have an idea of what you want to do? And I, I wasn't really sure. And he said, you know, well, why don't you come, you know, let's get you certified. Let's get you, let's kind of get you into this realm. You know, I need a guy that I can trust with, with the hockey players. And I think you'd be great having the playing background. So, you know, got my certification and started getting into it. And that's when, um, on the coaching side, um, one of my training partners who, uh, who I kind of skated with my last couple of years playing, he, you know, held a pretty prominent role in a couple of skill development companies and a couple of pretty highly regarded academies around Edmonton. And, you know, he kind of brought me under his wing and that got me into the coaching realm and the skill development realm. Um, and to be honest, like it was just kind of, you know, all came together at the perfect time. So I've kind of got these three avenues that I kind of delegate my time to. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing the personal training with, you know, your everyday regular people, which I really like um, training hockey players, which is definitely, you know, my, my passion right now. I'm um, coaching a U15 um, academy team here in Edmonton as well as doing um, some skill development stuff as well. So I'm definitely keeping as busy as I can. And, and that's kind of what I have going on right now. Yeah. So how, how's all, like, all the coaching going and all that, especially during this time, like just trying to stay busy, as busy as you can and like growing the, growing the game with, for the younger generation? Yeah, totally. And, and I love coaching. You know, I think it's, I think if I wasn't, you know, coaching a team right now, I think I'd be missing playing a lot more um, just because that way, you know, I still get that competitive edge to it. You know, training, training is great. And it's, I love getting guys prepared and then being able to see what they can do after putting in work. But when you, you know, when you're, when you're in a game situation with, you know, a group of athletes that all have, you know, the same goal, they all want to get better. They all, you know, they all have one common purpose and you can see their drive and, you know, it's, you're in that game scenario, it just, it, it still feels competitive to me. And I think that's a big part of why I do enjoy it is, and, and you know, the, the team that I coach these kids, like, I'm just thinking back to when I was, you know, 13, 14 years old, like these kids are so good nowadays. They're so good. And, and the skills they have and the mindset and, and they're just like, they're young professionals that young, because that's just how it is. You know what I mean? The, the game is specializing earlier and earlier and earlier and you know I, I don't agree with it happening too early because I think kids you know kids should be kids still but you know if, it, if it's a decision they want to make and what, hockey's what they want to do um, and they take it seriously you know I think that there's a lot of great outlets now that maybe we didn't have when we were growing up at that age necessarily and the game's come a long way in that regard so um, yeah just trying to you know pass on what I learned when I was playing and, and you know getting to play at the professional level what it took and and, you know, just really, really treating kids, they know the proper way to go about stuff, you know, on a day-to-day -day routine and, and habits, you know, and making sure they have good attitudes and a good work ethic and stuff, because, you know, this, the skill stuff is great, but these kids, like, they're just, they're phenomenal, so young now. So if you can, if you can get the coachability and, and the work ethic and, and, you know, you get them to think the game the right way, it's, you know, who, who's, who's to say where they'll go, right? So just trying to just trying to pass on my little bit of sliver of knowledge from, from my playing days and, and see what we can do with this, this young group of kids we have here. Yeah, exactly. And the game keeps, just keeps getting better and better each year, faster and faster. And it's more, more skilled now than it maybe was like a few years ago. And like the game and just like everyone's hockey IQ is getting a lot better to it. Just even from the younger generation coming up, like it's, it's awesome to see how, how the game's growing and like the, how the game's going for, for the future as well as what, what where it's at right now yeah totally it, it's it's honestly crazy like i i'm just i always think back like when i'm in practice and i'm teaching these kids like you know we're going through you know our offensive zone four check and defensive zone four check and neutral zone and and breakouts and like all this stuff and i'm thinking back and i'm like man like i didn't even know what these words meant when i was 13 years old like i was a pretty good hockey player young right like i you know i thought i was pretty good for where I was at and it's like these kids they just make it look so so easy nowadays it's it's honestly crazy yeah for for real like when I was like maybe like 12 13 coming up like like you would not expect the game how the game is right now like even seven years from seven years in the past just it's crazy how, how good these kids are and they're a lot better than than I played than the guys I played against like everyone that I was so it's awesome to see the growth in the game and everything going going towards like the speed wise and the skill set of the game. No, totally. I can't, I can't agree more. Like we'll, 
the, the kids they love. We always open practice. We'll play, you know, a, a three puck scrimmage against the coaches or we'll do like a little mini game to get them into it. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm not going a hundred percent, but like, you know, I turn it on a little bit to get, get the kids into it. And we start going and these kids are just like buzzing around the ice. Like they like, it's just, it's honestly, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's a super cool moment to see, like, like you said, just how far the game has come and, and kind of what direction it's going. And I think that it's, it's only going to get bigger from here. And you're, and you're starting to kind of see hockey take on a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit more of a, a personality to, you know, it's, it's starting to have, um, you know, a bit of an outlet kind of like the NBA, the NFL, the MLB, you know, guys are starting to show a little bit more of their, their character. And these kids are, you know, they're infatuated with the, the McDavid's and, you know, the Pavel Barbers and they all want to, you know, the skill and everything. And it's, it's becoming a little bit more flashy. And, you know, I, I love the, I love the physical aspect of the game and, and I don't think that that should ever go away. And, you know, I know the game is, it's largely skill based now, you know, maybe it's not, um, you know, quite as physical or, or they say it's not as competitive as it once was, but I just think that either way, you know, the, the product that's going to be on the ice is going to be something that people are going to watch, whether, you know, there's 10 fights a game or none. Um, just the, the passion these kids have to, to be the best nowadays, it's, it, it's honestly crazy. And I think it's only going to do good things for the game. Yeah, exactly. And just social media as well as has definitely helped spike the game. Like you said, just from like all these guys having certain YouTube channels, like, like baseball players, hockey players, like I know DK uh, is a good friend of the show. I know he's a good friend of yours and like, he's sorry. He had a, he has a YouTube channel, his own company. Like I, I could go on and on about guys that have been influential on the internet, but like you, over the summer, like in quarantine, like you and DK did uh, how to be a professional. And I, I was in some of those and you guys talked about like work ethic, like confidence. So like go a little, go into that a little bit and just like how, how like being a professional is and what that meant to you guys. Yeah. So it's funny you brought that up. Like obviously like me and DK are really close friends. We were roommates um, my last year pro and, and, and we kind of think um, the same way about stuff. And obviously he's big into the same realm as me, just a little bit different, you know, obviously he's, he's more fine tuned to the goalie aspect and, and, and more so mobility and stuff like that. But he, like you said, he's got a great, he's got a great online presence now and he's absolutely killing the social media. Um, and, you know, so we were, we were just kind of on FaceTime one day and, and sitting there when we were in lockdown thinking like, how can we, you know what I mean? Like we're not working right now. Like, how can we get, how can we get this to become a little bit bigger? You know, how can we make this a bigger thing? And Dylan had the idea, well, why don't we do, you know, like a weekly zoom show? And we had, um, at the time I had about 12, um, hockey kids that I was doing, um, who were supposed to be in my summer training program that we ended up starting online only. So we kind of created this like, um, you know, Facebook group and this little bit of a community where, you know, Dylan was in charge of all the mobility and the recovery and I was doing the strength and conditioning. Um, and we had a Facebook group where they could ask questions. We would post articles, we'd post stuff for them. Um, and then me and Dylan kind of stumbled on the idea of doing like a once a week Zoom call just to like check in with them, make sure they were doing okay. And, and then kind of from that spiraled into us being, you know, opening up to other people um, because there is such a, such a, um, you know, want for that knowledge from kids these days and they want to know the path and and you know they always you always hear guys talk about like the path wasn't easy or how did you get here and it was you know and we we tried to really explain what you can start doing at that age to make sure that you have as great a chance as possible to get to the point where we got to in our careers um, so basically we started, you know, we, I think we only ended up getting two episodes done and then the world opened back up and we got kind of busy. I know we have plans to, um, to do return to that. Cause I think it was going to be, um, something that people would find a lot of value in. Um, and, and just, yeah, we, you know, we talked about everything from, you know, what should your game day routine be like, you know, what should your pregame warm up look like? What should, um, you know, your in-season training and stuff. And we had all these topics lined up because it really does, you know, when, when someone says like, well, how do you be a professional? There's so many avenues you can take. But if, if I really had to break it down, you know, to kids at a young age is just, you know, to give yourself the best opportunity to be found or to be, 
seeing or to, to keep continuing is you need to be coachable, right? You need to have intangibles and you need to have a work ethic. And, and really you can take those three and you can make them sound like 2000 more points, but that's really what it boils down to because like we just talked about these kids, they're all insanely skilled. It's nuts. They're all skilled. Um, you know, they can all skate, they can all shoot, they can all pass. It's, you know, the, the, the work ethic at practice, the work ethic off the ice, um, you know, are they coachable? Are they receptive to feedback? You know, do, you know, where's their hockey IQ at? If it's not great, are they receptive to learning? Um, do they want to get better? Do they want to put the work in? And, and, you know, if you can check all those boxes on a kid, I think, you know, especially if you can grab them at a young age, it's really this, the ceiling is, is who knows how high for, for an athlete like that. Yeah, absolutely. And just going in like the student being, being a student of the game, like everyone, everyone should be a student of the game. You learn stuff every day. Like I know like a lot of guys I've talked to from the podcast have said that they've learned, they learn new stuff every day about the game that they didn't know or about like training and all that stuff. And just how important is being a student of the game, like being coachable, being like able to like take, take criticism when you can, or when you, when your coaches give you criticism and just help yourself get better and better each day. Well, yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and it's funny. Um, just a quick, a quick point when, when DK and I were living together with our other roommate, uh, Kyle Thacker, who's another Canadian kid, you know, we'd come home, you know, every night after what we do during the day, we do our practice and we, you know, we'd have our workout and we'd come home. And, and as soon as it was dinner time, you know, I was firing up the laptop and we were putting, putting whatever NHL game was on the TV. And, and after a while, and Dylan's like, why are you guys like, why are you guys watching hockey every night? Like all we do all day is hockey related stuff. And, and it was funny because, you know, I think Dylan loves the game too. Right. It doesn't mean he needs to watch it. Or, but like, that's just how I've always been. And, and even more so now, you know, and, and like you said too, with the social media, there's so many, so many avenues and so many outlets that kids can go and look to for, for that knowledge. Like I, I still, to this day, I'm learning something new every day, whether it's from one of my kids or I see something, you know, on Instagram from the outlets I follow or one of my other coaches or, or, you know, the owner of our gym, who's, you know, been a great mentor to me. Like, you know, I, I truly believe if you can be a sponge around the game of hockey, you can, you can get to whatever level you want. And it's at a certain point, um, you know, checking your ego at the door, just as if you were a hockey player and, and knowing that there are people that know more about what you're passionate about than you do. There's always going to be somebody who knows more about skill development. There's always going to be somebody who knows more about the training. There's always going to be somebody that knows more about mobility, more about, you know, systems, tactics, and just really being receptive to all those avenues, especially when an opportunity presents itself and, and not being that guy that needs to know everything or be Mr. Perfect, I think has really helped me because I've, never had a problem with admitting that I didn't know something or if I'm not sure I have no problem asking somebody if I don't know something and that's really I think when I realize that that I've kind of found this you know new level that I've taken everything to um, especially in this past year and it's I think that like I said again you know really where is the ceiling who knows because if you can keep being a student of the game like you've seen and, and keep finding ways to add value to your players or to your clients or anything like that then really um you know you can you can take whatever you're doing to whatever level you want as long as you're receptive to that kind of outlet yeah that, that's a great point there and just if you don't know something just ask there's gonna there's been tons of other people that will know what what your issue is and help you figure that out so there's always going to be somewhere someone that knows more than you and uh, and they'll they'll definitely help you out like I just a, just a quick point that I and I you know I'll I would say this to anybody and I'd have no problem saying it on here it's Gary Roberts like he's you know he's the guru of hockey training right now and and for good reason if you look at the guys that he's kind of worked with and where they've gone but like you know at the end of the day when I'm at home and I'm scrolling through Instagram like I'll stop and I'll I'll really read you know whatever he's posted that day and and try to internalize it and you know if there's stuff that he posts for his athletes i'm like oh like that's pretty cool like i'm gonna try and work that in and it's just there's no shame in that right like it doesn't there's such a such a stigma of of people especially in the hockey world that they need to be 
they need to be the best at what they do. And, and someone is going to be the best, but everyone who's not is trying to get there and, and how they do it. You know, you know, if I would be different, if I was going on there and I was stealing Gary Roberts, you know, philosophies and branding them as my own, but there's that's that's the great thing about the world today is there is such an easily accessible wealth of knowledge from people who are better at things than you and that's that's no fault to your own and i think that that's a great um that's a great tool that people can use if they want to know more about what they're doing or really about anything and i think that that's the biggest thing that like we always tell our kids you know like did you guys watch this game last night? Like, did you guys see that? And they're always like, oh yeah, I was playing Fortnite or I was playing Call of Duty. And it's like, okay, that's fine too. Like you can be a kid, but if, you know, when you guys are watching NHL games, if you are watching them, like I used to cam a guy for a shift. Like if you're a forward and you want to be like Connor McDavid, watch Connor McDavid for a full 45 second shift and don't take your eyes off him and pick up on, you know, how does he get faster with the puck on a stick, you know? How does he skate? Where is his eyes? You know, how does he position them? Like little things like that. I think that like he goes back to just being a student of the game and, and always trying to increase that knowledge pool. And it's only going to help you in the end, right? Yeah, exactly. That's perf- perfectly said. And just there's tens of thousands of players just trying to get better and trying to be the best. But you just, you just got to keep going your own path and finding out stuff from social media, YouTube, wherever you're going to watch games. And you can just pick something out and just place in your game or like help you to get better. And then like NHL network does, an- does analyze some of the plays that like, I, I remember, I remember sitting here like when, like during like the bubble and all that, just NHL network on like after, after games, they're just analyzing different plays. And uh, especially Kevin Weeks, like he's like a big time guy with like, the analytics and all that and he's like you 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 younger players out there got to watch this and do that so it's there's always learn ways to learn every at every single moment totally i know i agree 100 percent. i think too like the only the only caution out of out of all of this like great wealth of resources is just for for kids especially to be wary who they're listening to um and that kind of comes with the territory i think you know a, a lot of people um especially in the hockey world like i said they think they're the best um and maybe you know and and everybody has their own way and and i'm not saying that you know anyone's doing it wrong but there are people out there that i think are um you know maybe especially in canada because it is a lucrative industry whether people want to admit it or not you know that's it's the hockey you know hockey kids who want to be the best it's hockey's not a cheap sport and you know, if a kid tells his mom that he wants to be the best or he tells his dad, I want to be the best and dad invests, you know, X amount of dollars into skating lessons, but the skating coach has never played hockey or, or, you know, stuff along that lines is just, just being wary of where they're getting that resources from. But I think there is a lot more good than bad out there. So again, it's, it's just a a kid who wants to get better and wants to learn. There's a million ways they can do it. and, And normally they're, isn't a lot of paths that lead to the wrong direction. It's just always, you know, obviously being wary of, of who you're trusting and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more with what you said there. So going through your journey, you played, a, you played a few seasons in the, in juniors for the Grande Prairie Storm and the Sex, Sex Smith Vipers and the AJHL and the NWJHL. It's like, what was your journey through junior hockey? And like, what were some of the biggest takeaways that you've learned throughout that time? Yeah, I, I kind of, I had a weird, I had a weird junior hockey experience. Um, I, I really only played one full year of junior. Um, so when I was in mid to triple A, um, I was signed early in my mid to triple A year, I ended up getting called up um, a couple different times and playing four games that year and then um, made the team uh, the next year at a training camp, but didn't really um, get in the lineup a whole lot the first half of the year. And then just with Hockey Canada's rules, junior A teams are allowed to card and carry, um, you know, whatever it is, 23 or 25 guys up until, you know, early December. And then they usually have to um, sign you to what's called a hard card. And that'll be the hard 20 man roster they'll carry for the rest of the year. So I made the team, um, but I think in our first 20 games, I maybe played 12 or 25 games I played 12, you know, and, and and it got really, it got really frustrating at times just because um, I didn't feel like I was getting a fair shot really. And, and 
I probably honestly would have left sooner, but that was Grand Prairie was my hometown and my grandparents have been season ticket holders there for, you know, 30 odd years. And it was, it was like my dream to play for that team. So I was like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to stay here. And then I remember um, early December, our team was going on a road trip somewhere for two or three days. And coach calls me and one of our other guys in the office and he said, Hey, like, you know, we're going to Lloydminster or wherever for the weekend. Um, like you guys aren't going to play, but like, we want you to go and get in some games. I'd like to go play with this junior B team in Sexsmith. And we're thinking like, uh, okay. Um, and so they take off to Lloydminster and we're just supposed to play the one game the Saturday night in Sexsmith. And we're playing in the, this Northwest junior hockey league. It is, it is like, it would be like the craziest division of the Nall you've ever seen. Like it's, this is like jungle hockey. Like it was nuts. Like I remember this little town, Sexsmith is probably 25 minutes outside of the Grand Prairie, which is already a small town. And, and this place was just a concrete jungle. And I remember going out there and like three seconds after puck drop, there was like a bench clearing brawl. And I just remember looking at my buddy that was up there with me and I'm like, what are we doing here? And he ended up getting tossed like six minutes later for just blowing a kid up from behind. And I finished the game and I'm like, called my dad after I'm like, I'm never playing another game in this league ever again. And ended up getting in a couple more games before Christmas. And then we uh, went home for our Christmas break back to Edmonton. And I just like halfway through the break, I was like, I'm not playing for this guy anymore. So called the coach, told him I was done. And, and really I didn't even have a backup plan. And uh, luckily, um, Bram Steven, who was my mid AAA coach, my bottom AAA coach, who is now coaching this university team, um, he had reached out because he saw that uh, my name had come up on transfers on Elite Prospects as, as not carded with Grand Bear. And he asked what went on. And I said, like, I'm, I'm just done. Like, I'm not doing that for a year. I and mean, this guy's not giving me a chance to play. And I, I think I deserve a shot at least. Um, and he said, well, do you want to go to school? I said, yeah, I was probably going to go to school. I had no idea what I wanted to do yet, really. Um, and he said, well, why don't you come out for, for one of our skates after Christmas and, and see what you think, and we can talk from there. And I went out for their, I think their first skate back was after New Year's, and I decided, you know, a couple of days later, I was like, yeah, let's do it. So played the rest of that season for uh, McEwen, and then ended up playing three and a half more years there, and I'm pretty, pretty fortunate that I kind of got led down that path. Um, you know, I always learned a lot from Bram. He's one of my favorite coaches. I do the strength training for his team. And this, he coaches um, Spruce Grove now in the same league, junior league that I played in. So I work for him now. Um, some of the time training his voice. So it's just kind of funny how that opportunity presented itself. But I'm in the long run, I'm, I'm glad. You know, obviously guys always talk about junior. Junior hockey is the best time of your life. And I'm, I'm sure it would have been a good time. But I'm, I'm not mad about missing out on that path by any means. I think that I still ended up ultimately where... I wanted to be and I'm very grateful for for the way that I got to go through it yeah a, li a little null south division there at, yeah, at exactly. null yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, that's just crazy that like how different that league was and how like there was like a bench clear like within like five minutes of the game and just like, yeah crazy and then your yeah. buddy got tossed so that, it, it makes for the best memories though but like it's yeah it, definitely uh interesting hockey there that's for it sure. is yeah it's definitely that's that's the word i would use too <laughs> <laughs> yes and then like you said you played three and a half years for grant McEwen university so like what was that what was the college hockey experience like for you compared to like what you experienced in juniors i know your first year you played 12 games registering two assists like or like your expectations going in a college hockey as well well, I was, so it's funny, I, at the time in that league, because kind of how it works in, in Canada is like, obviously guys, when they're, you know, if they're good enough, 16, they go and play junior and you can play until you're 20. And then guys would go to, if they're going to go to school, they would go to school after that. So you're 21, 22, starting college. I was 18 years old, a defenseman. And I was the youngest kid in that league by, I think, almost three years. And right away though that that program where it was when I got there was, was kind of um you know for lack of a better term a shit show when I arrived and and you know it was a good league still it was it was probably the second tier university league in, in Canada at the time behind CIS which is you know University of Alberta all those big programs um that move a lot of guys on to pro 
and you know right away um i go from like not playing for two three weeks at a time and i'm playing you know 20 25 minutes a night against men and it was honestly i'm very grateful for that because it kind of forced me to to really um you know learn how to play the game the right way especially at that time you know i was doing okay height wise but i hadn't really filled out yet and i'm playing against these grown men and they're just manhandling me around the ice and and i had to get that out of my game very early so i think that's really too when i kind of um found a bit of a passion for the training and, and you know getting bigger and getting stronger and getting faster and just trying to find a way to adapt um to that game so yeah i only I, I, like i said i only got in the second half of that year um and, and in that league we only played at the time i think 28 games so i played every game from when i started to the end of the year we didn't make playoffs that year um and then came back you know as a as a veteran at 19 years old and, and just kind of really started to blossom and, and get more confidence in my game and i played more and more every year and then um after my last year um that program went on to win three championships back to back um two of them under bram and then now they've been accepted um conditionally into cis so they've actually moved up into the top league in canada so it's kind of cool to be to be able to say that i was kind of there at the grassroots beginning of of what's now turned into a bit of a powerhouse of a program and, and like i said i'm i wouldn't have trade, traded those four years for four years of junior any day of my life if you ask me yeah that that's awesome how like you you were there when it was like obviously not awesome but like you saw it saw it grow from like the bottom and now it's in the cis and it's in one of the top leagues in in canada so that's that must be awesome to see it's like when you were 18 like looking to get bigger and more confident like what would you do to in the gym to help yourself get bigger stronger more explosive all that it's funny because at the time like hockey it's crazy again like you like we've talked about before how far the game has come like training for the game has also come that far like back then it was like you know you're you're doing your main compound lifts and you're lifting as heavy as you possibly can six days a week and then you're running hills or you're you know that kind of stuff and there was no real like methodical approach to hockey training it was get in your deadlifts, get in your bench, get in your barbell back squat, your front squats, your cleans, you know, and then get in your, you know, get in your sprints and you were good if you did that. And so at the time, you know, and that's, it was probably good that it was that way because all I really needed was to get bigger and stronger. Um, so again, Brett, the, the guy who owns our gym here, who trained me, he actually was our trainer at McEwen and that's kind of how um, I first met Brett. Um, so we would be in the gym, you know, with the college schedule, we only play on weekends. Um, so we'd be practicing five days a week in the gym, four days a week. So that again, too, was a big, big part for me, I think, is just having that time, um, in season to not deplete everything I worked for all summer. Cause that's normally how it would go. You know, you go into camp 25 pounds heavier and you come out at the end of the season, looking like a skeleton. Um, and that was always a big problem for me is just eating enough and, and keeping up on the training during the year to maintain my weight where I was comfortable playing um, the type of game that I played. And I think, you know, being in a college schedule that young allowed me to, to gain that strength um, a lot faster than maybe than I would have if I was playing a 72 game schedule, you know, playing junior A and, and more so just practicing and maybe only getting one or two lifts in a week. So again, the, the college schedule worked great for me that way. Um, and, and just really, I think probably catapulted the, the development on that side of things just to, to really get me to a good spot where I was kind of heading out of university. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's great that it really helped you with everything, just got bigger and stronger, especially when you're playing against 21, 22, 23 year olds and you're only 18, 19. So that, that's a, that's a huge step. So like, would you say that was like the biggest struggle that you've had in college hockey was just being that younger guy the entire time and just trying to keep yourself getting bigger and like competing with these men. Yeah. And I think, I think honestly, that was probably ultimately my, my downfall. And, you know, I'm not scared to admit it, you know, probably th from when I was allowed to hit in Pee Wee all the way up to my first year of college, like, you know, I was scared to get rocked by a big guy, but I love to hit. And it was just, it was always so like, I love to hit people, but I hated getting hit. And I, you know, probably partially because I wasn't very strong and I wasn't very big yet that I was 
had a little bit of that timidness in my game. And, you know, like I said, when I'm playing against, you know, guys, some of them were 25, 26, 27, big burly men, like to survive, like you have to adapt to survive and and just making that conscious and it was more so i think a shift in my head that like i've been hit before and it doesn't hurt you know if you get cranked sure it's you're gonna feel it but I, i've never been hit so hard that i was like i can't you know i can't play hockey again or i can't get up or you know anything like that and and there's gonna be times in the game when you're gonna get hurt and maybe it's from a hit or maybe it's from something else and that's just part of the game and i think once i got to be comfortable with that and got to be comfortable with the physical aspect of the game that it just everything else in my game took off you know my confidence got better you know I was making more confident plays I was escaping out of hits I was skating around people because that's kind of always been my strong suit is I was always able to skate really well especially for someone who was long and rangy and lanky um, and just using that to my strength to you know avoid when I have to or, or when I do need to get physical having the strength that I was able to be an effective player at the college level at, you know, 18, 19 years old. Yeah, exactly. And that's a great point. And then after your senior year, you said you were dealing with an injury. It's so like, how hard was also was that to get over? And then especially like if you wanted to play pro hockey, it's like that must have been like a difficult process because you had to take a year off and then get back into training. So like how difficult was that year? Yeah, well, to be honest, like, the timing of it was um, pretty peculiar. I was, after that year, I was planning to be done in hockey. You know, I didn't really have any plans or any thoughts that I could play pro. I'd, I'd always wanted to, you know, it's every kid's dream to play in the NHL, but did I think it was really a possibility? No. Um, and, and I ended up breaking my hand um, in January, and I was actually... I was working at a bar at the time on weekends during college. I would go to the, you know, and I would work security after our games just for a little bit of extra money here and there. And I was breaking up a fight, not even in the fight, breaking up a fight. And I bounced my hand off of this stone fireplace mm. like a week and a half before our second semester was supposed to start and shattered my hand completely. I've got two plates now, two pins, two screws in my left hand. And, and it was really hard to regain the use of a couple of my fingers um, for a long time, longer than when the fracture kind of healed, just getting that, um, that kind of that dexterity back and the feeling so stuff like you know even like writing for a while or not writing um, like holding things you know picking things up or using my fingers to point or touch or anything like that was just a lot harder than I thought it was going to be from something that was in my hand a lot longer so you know I just kind of come to terms with with kind of being done playing and and then uh, midway through that summer um the guy who eventually became my agent and who I now coach with um, came a franchise who played in the AHL for a long time. East Coast League won a Kelly Cup. Um, you know, he just out of the blue, like asked me, like, why don't you go and play, try and go play pro? Yeah. And he was still playing um, in the A at the time. So he had a lot of contacts in the coast and, and in the AHL with coaches and stuff. And I was like, well, I'm like, I, I can't do that. I'm not, I'm not even close to being there. And he's like, I will get you a tryout somewhere like pro in the States, you're going to skate with me this summer. You're going to train with me this summer. And he's like, we're going to see what we can do. And I was like, honestly, I have nothing going on here. I was like, why not? Let's give it a shot. So the next day he was training with Brett. So I came into the gym, started training with Kane training with Brett, skating with Kane three, four times a week. Um, made a lot of progress that summer with him, just learning from a defenseman who's you know, he, he makes the game look so easy and he's a great skater too. And just learning how to be effective um, at that level. And, and, you know, going into Kansas city, that's probably the, it's probably the most like starstruck nervous I've ever been just, you know, from even getting like emails in the summer about them signing me. And then like the equipment manager, like sending me this sheet of like, I need like your in-step height for these skate and like all, all this crazy stuff that you never think about and just really got like the, kind of the buzz going in me again. And then I remember showing up to camp and I ended up getting there, um, you know, about a week or so early so I could do the captain skates, which are the informal skates that the players, no coaches on the ice, the guys just show up a week or two before camp and they, we scrimmage and we work out together and stuff just to kind of get back in the routine. And I remember stepping on the ice that first day and just being like, holy shit like this is like this is hockey 
and it just like it ignited me and i was like i wanted nothing more than to make that team and then i and like from there on i was just like so driven and so focused and ended up sticking right up until the season opener date when um kansas city who was uh, calgary's farm team calgary and dallas had made a trade for can't remember who it was, but Dallas sent a defenseman to Calgary, which pushed a guy down to Stockton, which then pushed one guy down to Kansas City on the season opener date. And I ended up getting a release that day. And it was it was tough because I didn't really even know what the SP was at that time. Um, and I, I was just like, well, I guess I'm going to go back home and get a job. And um, the coach there was awesome, John Scott Dixon. You know, I think he felt really bad because he – he was kind of aware of where I was coming from after not playing for a year. And he even told me, he's like, listen, like for a kid who didn't play last year and came from a tier two university in Canada, like you were right there. And I think that that gave me a lot of confidence that I'd be valuable to somebody. And I remember packing up my stuff at my house um, in Kansas city and getting, you know, my phone just started like buzzing, like every five minutes from all these random numbers, like U S area codes. And I'm like, what is going on right now? And, I'm checking my voicemails and it's like, um, you know, Knoxville, this is Jeff Carr calling, Pensacola, you know, Macon, all these like SPHL teams. And I'm like, what is going Like, did someone put it like send an email out or like what's going on here? And then I'm like, remember my dad sending me the link to the ECHL website. He's like, oh yeah, like I saw your name like being as released on here. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, there's a, there's a waiver transaction wire that gets released daily in the ECHL. And, I was like, oh, okay, this is starting to make sense. And I, so I started doing some research, looking into the SPHL. And I was like, you know what? Like, if I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it my all. And I'm really happy I went there. Knoxville was an awesome place to play and, and really got me kind of into that professional lifestyle and, and just, you know, how to be a pro and, and really got confidence up in my game. And I had a great first year. And I think that's probably part of the reason why um, I ended up getting called back up to the coast at the end of that year, played a couple of games in Greenville. Um, and then from there, you know, I just obviously played another year after that, but that was, that was probably one of the most cool experiences just being in that first, first pro training camp with, you know, some great players and, and just really getting to see what, what being a pro is all about. Yeah, exactly. And then you, you go to Knoxville, you score three goals, so like, what was, what was like that first goal feeling like and just like everything you've been through and your first professional goal, like I bet your emotions were running high at that point. Yeah, it was, it was actually pretty special. I remember um, finding out actually after um, I had left for the season that year that my dad, um, he had been cancer free for almost 18 months um, at the time and we found out that it had come back, um, unfortunately, and, and I just remember like getting every opportunity on the power play and, and coming so close so many times in that game in December. Um, yeah, I think I was, and it was actually funny cause my, my two roommates assisted on my first professional goal. So um, just remember like making a pass down, kind of pulling the D to forward switch and, and getting lost in front of the net. I have no idea what I was doing down there, but my roommate Josh Erickson just fired a low shot from the point. And I remember just, coming right across the front of the net and sticking my stick out. And I seen the puck deflect off my stick and just go right over top of the goalie's shoulder and ant. And I just lost my mind. And, and it was weird too, because um, the announcer, like they announced it as Erickson's goal, but all the boys knew, you know, it was me. And then they came and gave me a big hug and I kind of pointed up to the rafters after I scored the goal. And, and it was, that was the feeling of, you know, getting your first and, got to send my picture of uh, the puck to my dad after the game. And then I ended up going home at Christmas, surprise him. And I wrapped the puck up and gave it to him for Christmas, my first pro goal. So that was probably one of the coolest moments in my hockey career. That was awesome. Yeah, that's a very special moment there for sure. That won't be taken away from you. That's for sure. So then you get called up to ECHL's Greenville Swamp Rabbits where you played two games, like you said. So what was it like getting that call up back to the coast and actually getting to play in a regular season game? That was really cool. I think that was just some validation that um, from earlier in the year in Kansas City that I did, um, you know, have the ability to play there as, as short as it was. And I, 
you know, some outside circumstances um, kind of brought me back to Knoxville earlier than I think their coach even wanted to happen because they were they were pretty decimated on the back end. They had some injuries and they had a couple um, guys who were on NHL contracts that had to go up and get their AHL games fulfilled towards the end of the year. So um, I was hoping to stick there because it was getting towards the end of the year. And I'm, I'm still adamant that if I would have been able to stick there, you know, I probably would have gotten a shot um, to play there full time, but, but to no discredit, I had, it was a great experience. Like I said, too, we, me and um, my goalie, got both got called up after um, a game. We beat Roanoke at home, like 10, nothing wearing SpongeBob jerseys and just, just a great atmosphere. Just like one of the best games ever. Coach called us both in after he's like, Hey, you guys are going up to Greenville. I'm like, Oh, this is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um and right before we left the rink and and you know it was saturday night the boys were going out we were going to have a good little time we're thinking this is awesome we'll get to go out get up in the morning we'll drive to greenville and we'll play on you know whatever tuesday wednesday and cars he calls us in right before we're walking out and he goes yeah um like you guys are probably gonna have to leave like pretty early in the morning and we go why and he goes well you guys play at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon and we're thinking like what and Greenville was probably a three and a half, four hour drive from Knoxville. So we had to get up the next morning after playing the night before, drive three and a half hours. We made it to the game or made it to the rink like right before guys had to be there. So we got in there, unpacked our stuff, you know, met the coach, signed our contracts. And before I even knew it, like I was going out for warm up in my first, um, you know, regular season game in the UCHL. And that was again just a, awesome moment and a great atmosphere and we got to play the two games and then unfortunately you know we got sent back right before they were going on a road trip but but again it was just again just a great great memory that i'll never forget yeah exactly and that experience must have you must have learned a lot through those two games and just how the how the coaches ran like how, how good you have to be to actually be in the coast and stay in the coast so that, that must have been a big learning experience for you and then you get moved to Fayetteville for the next for the for the season and then the following season your last pro season and you were very successful in Fayetteville so like what do you think helped you be so successful in Fayetteville for the marksman well I think like getting I I was with a very very our team in Knoxville was very very close that year and, and we we were you know a tight-knit group and 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 getting dealt on the deadline day when you know, I had been playing as good there as I was. Like I was, I think the second or third top scoring demon on that team as a rookie, you know, I was playing a ton every night and just, just to get that call and just to get so blindsided. Like I just remember our equipment manager calling me crying you know, our trainer was devastated. My roommates were like, everybody was like, we could have never seen this coming and just kind of taking all that negative energy and just kind of really being like, I mean, like I have something to prove and you know getting traded to Fayetteville like they were in the basement they were bottom of the league um so I just kind of finished that year out with a bit of a chip on my shoulder you know trying to prove a point that you know trading me was the wrong decision um you know like I think I had eight points in 12 games in Fayetteville to finish out the year um so that was great for me personally obviously the you know the team didn't end up anywhere close to where you know, the owners or anything coaches wanted it to be, but, but they expressed to me at the end of that year, you know, that I was going to be a big part um, of coming back there next year if I wanted to. And they protected me and I had voiced to them that I'm, you know, I'm going to go to UCHL camp and my goal is to play there. But um, if something happens where, you know, if I get released, um, you know, we can have a conversation about me coming back, but um, just kind of, again, it was very, very similar to, kind of my journey in college is, is seeing Fayetteville where they were in their, you know, their first year in the league, um, kind of at the basement and then getting to be a part of really galvanizing that team the next year. And then looking at what they did last year, being, being first in the league when the league got shut down again is just a, a pretty cool, pretty cool thing to say that you were a part of twice in your hockey career, let alone in, in pro hockey. Yeah, that, that's also how, how like you got like had that chip. No, not awesome that you had the chip on your shoulder, but like you had to prove yourself and got eight points in the twelve games you were there, and just really proved your proved to your, yourself and the the team that released you, and the team you're on currently on that you're there to stay, and then you got you played in fifty two games your last season, so that must have been a huge confidence boost, especially since you didn't get to play that many games in any of your pro games pro years so far. 
So that must have been a, a huge victory for you and a huge boost in confidence and like anything like just to stay positive throughout all this pro all the process and everything and just get to play and just to get get to play the game you love and be there for the for the love of the game. Yeah, that was awesome. Like just to and I think more to prove to myself too, because all through you know, I'd never played a full year of junior, so I never got to play the 72 game or the 62 game. You know, university, we only played the 32 game schedule. And my first year pro, like bouncing around and battling a couple of injuries and just kind of getting over like that first like 50 game mark in one year and being like, I'm still alive was was pretty cool. And I think I ended up at I think I ended up at 95 professional games played. So it would have been nice to get, uh, to get one more year, but I, I had come to terms with where I was at and, and I, I was ready to kind of take the next step in my life. And, and as much as it would have been awesome to play again, you know, I, I think that I made the right decision. I, I still think about it um, today, you know, if I would have stayed and, and played a couple more years where I would have ended up, but I'm, I'm very grateful for, for everything that the game gave me. And I think that, for someone who only played two years professional, I've probably got, um, you know, enough experiences and, and things to, I could sound like I played for 10 years and, and I'll always have that. And I think that, you know, the relationships I formed and just the bonds that I had and, and you know, just getting to experience every aspect of it is something that I'll never trade for, for anything in the world. Yeah, exactly. And you're still working with hockey players right now. You're still, you still love the game. So Tyler, to finish this off, I have one more question for you. And like, what would be like some tips you'd give younger players, like any players looking to get to the next level, even if like they're struggling just like to keep the positivity and like keep, keep them going forward. Yeah. I think I just, just try to find, try to find your happy place in the game and, and what, you know, try to find a, a spot that gives you confidence. And if you are, you know, one of those situations where maybe you're feeling down, just remember that, that especially if you're young, you know, that's your road doesn't stop there. You're always going to get another chance with another coach or a different team or, or anything. And there's always stuff that you can do as a player to ensure that you're in the best possible position. And, and like I said before, is being coachable, um, you know, having a good work ethic and, and having those intangibles that every coach looks for and, and every no is just another chance for somebody to say yes on you and, and every door closed, another door opens. Um, so keep on grinding, you know, don't ever quit on yourself, believe in yourself, play with confidence and always have fun. Exactly. A hundred percent. That's perfectly said. So Tyler, Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time and want to wish you the best of luck going forward in your post career in hockey and with the, with the fitness center and everything. Just good luck with all that. And we'll, we'll talk soon. Appreciate that, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem.